privilege and the opportunity to be here today with you. May you embolden us and strengthen us for your service. We pray for those we mentioned in our prayers, or four prayers earlier today for Ruth, for my family, for the family of those at home that are unable to reach out and communicate to us. But Lord, you know their particular concerns that are upon their hearts, things that would distract them from being focused on what is about to take place here today. We ask that you would be with them and remove their burdens, lighten their load, walk with them in their challenges of life, lift them up. And God, we ask you to help us to have the same spirit that we too, rather than piling on difficulties to them, we might reach out our hands in love. We just thank you for these opportunities to be here today, for the worship that we have, the opportunity and privilege to be here in this place. We pray that you would multiply the voices that are gathered here today throughout the world. For we know that there are millions of churches on this day who are worshiping you with a billion plus people. And for that, we give you thanks that you unite us as one people. Well, we disagree about a lot of things sometimes, and we, we can be pretty stupid, honestly. But that's okay, because despite our foolishness sometimes, you bring us together as one people. The Holy Spirit has the power to overcome many of the things that would divide us. And let us know that truly what's important, as we just sang, is about that love of God. So we pray that you would bless us and bring us together as one people so this world might be transformed. Prepare our hearts for the message we're about to hear. The words of my, those present hearts, the words of my mouth might be present and ready for your blessing. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we recording already? Okay. Sorry about that. I, uh, I just didn't left my Bible there, so I apologize for the brief uh, vanish from the screen. I would invite you, for those who have your Bibles, you're welcome to open up to Matthew chapter 14. This lesson is not printed in your bulletin for today, as it often is, and it's a little bit lengthier lesson, but I would have you hear from the Gospel of Matthew. A parable that Jesus told to his disciples, and along with a great crowd of people, and so this, again, is one of those lessons about the end of times. Ooh. Matthew chapter, uh, verse 24, chapter 13. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a someone who's spread good seed in the field. But while everybody was asleep, the enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat. And then he went away. So when the plants came before and bore grain, the weeds appeared with them as well. The slaves of the householder came and said, Master, did you not uh, sow good seed in the field? Where then did these weeds come from? The master said, An enemy has done this. The slave said, Then let us go and gather them in. And he said, No, for in gathering in the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with, the, with them, the wheat along with them. So let both of these grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I will tell you, and tell all the reapers to can collect the weeds first, hand them over to the handler, handlers to be buried, burned, and gather the wheat in the barn. Here ends the gospel of reward. Thanks be to God. Today's lesson, believe it or not, is a lesson about the end times. And uh, when we ever hear that word end times, we think of great cataclysm, we think of the world coming to an end and all these types of things, but that's not often the way Jesus thinks of things. So oftentimes people come up to me as we talk about the end times, they'll say, don't you think we're in the end times right now? Look how bad the world is. And I said, well, you know what? Sure, we are in the end times. And we have been for 2,000 years. <sighs> well, but don't you think it's so much worse right now than it's ever been in the history of this world? It's getting so bad today. The world is falling apart. And I said, well, <clears throat> think about it from the perspective of uh, the African-American families in the United States of America. And you were to go up to them and say, oh, it's so much worse than it was in the 1800s. Yeah, lots of luck with that, right? I think for their families, the 1800s was a lot worse for them. Oh, how about the Jews in Germany in the 1940s? I think they kind of had a rough go of things back then that was a whole lot worse than anything we're going through today. And how about 
the Chinese at the same time because they were being slaughtered and wiped out. The, many of the Russian families back in the 1920s, you know the 20 million families in Russia, or 20 million people in Russia, were slaughtered by their government. I think it was a little bit rougher time for them back in those days than it is today. 100 million people homeless because of World War II. 60 million people murdered, killed, lost their lives because of World War II. I would say that was a little more difficult time than what we're living in right now. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther back in the 1500s said, thought that the world was falling apart. You want to know why? Because he saw for the very first time a cannon and he saw armies marching with cannons. He said, this is of the devil. The world is going to fall apart and come to an end. These are truly the end times. When he very first saw a cannon fire, and he saw the destruction that a cannon could wreck. So you can imagine uh, saying to somebody living in the medieval days, in both east and west, during the time of the plague. I don't know if you're aware of this. The plague was not an event that took place over maybe a five-year period of time. The plague kept coming back and back and back and back over 200 plus years. It decimated the populations of both East and West, killed maybe about 80% of their population centers, just destroyed them. And you're going to say that today is a worse time in which to live than any time in the history of the world? I am just telling you, I think you need to rethink your history. This is actually a relatively peaceful time compared to anything we've ever lived through. I know that's hard to imagine and the reason why it seems so bad is because it's so bad compared to what it was when you grew up. But I'm going to tell you why it seems so peaceful when you grew up. Because you had a wonderful mom and dad who protected you. And I'm telling you, your mom and dad thought the time that you grew up was a terrible time in which to grow up and raise up their kids. But they did the best job they could to protect you from all of that stuff so you didn't see it. But I'll tell you, I guarantee you, they sure didn't think it was a great time to bring you up. So you are thinking wrongly about the world and about the way things are. It's always been a tough time to live, but there are worse times than others, and as far as worse times or others, this is one of the better times in the history of the world in which to live. You have more of a chance to live to the age of 80, 90 years of age than at any time, you have a greater chance of never being a victim of violence. Oh my goodness, what about ISIS? What about this? And what about all the, 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 uh, the wild, radical Muslims are out there? You know, the percentage of people they're killing is mo most greatly they're killing their own people. Very few other people. Okay? It's not coming to a town next to you. It hasn't come to a town next to you. Okay, yes, in New York City, 2001, we've been relatively peaceful in this country. Yes, there have been a few attacks, but it's nothing compared to the violence that we perpetrate on ourselves. There are more people that die at the hands of other Americans than, uh, from guns than do from ISIS, for goodness sakes. And we're all panicky like the world is falling apart. Take a chill pill. It's all good. God is good. And this world is good. So let's take a look at the background of our lesson for today. I know some of you have already turned me off because you want to hear about the great cataclysm and all, all the people getting their due and the end of times. Well, I'm going to disappoint you. Go ahead, turn me off. That's all good. Because we're going to look at the parable of weeds and show you that this is actually a positive lesson, not a negative lesson about the end times. Jesus is a very positive individual. The only people he ever criticizes are political leaders and religious leaders, but not the average Joe and Sue. So look at the background of this lesson. This is a parable and a series of parables. There's no connection between the series of parables that Jesus is preaching, although he does speak a lot about the end times. Unlike the other Gospels, the context is not so important in these parables. Uh, they're just standalone parables. Here it is. It's about the end times. But as such, as a standalone parable, oftentimes they have multiple meanings and we can understand them in different ways. Now the players in the parable, according to Jesus, because Jesus goes and explains this parable to his disciples, and he says the sower is the son of man. The enemy, in the case of our lesson for today, is Satan. The grain are the people of uh, God, that's you and me. And the weeds are agents of evil who are embedded amongst the grains themselves and grow up along with them. The weeds 
Just for your information, don't become wheat. Wheat doesn't become wheat. That's not the way things work. But what happens is the master allows the wheat and the weeds to grow up together so that the weed, the wheat can produce fruit and grain is produced. So that's what the master says. Let them grow together. Now, I can tell you from experience, I used to work in a farm for three months. Worst summers, worst summer of my life. It was after my freshman year, between my freshman year and sophomore year of high school, and I had to get a job. And so I was working every day, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day in the fields. And let me tell you, it was awful. I hated it. I'm so glad I don't have to go back to being a farmer. But here's the thing, I had to get, you're on your knees, or sitting on your knees, or sitting down, or reaching over, bending over to pick strawberries, and then of course you go to uh, peas, or green beans, or something like that. It was awful, backbreaking work. The job that everybody wanted on the farm was hoeing corn. Because hoeing corn, you could get a hoe, and you could actually straighten up and stand up hoeing corn. It was great. But only the older guys, only the guys that were trusted got to hoe the corn. One day, they were short a guy hoeing corn. They came up to me and said, well, I guess your next guy in line, come down, you can hoe. I'm like, yes, finally. So I'm just sitting there for like maybe a half an hour, I'm hoeing corn. Finally, the boss comes up to me, grabs a hoe, and says, go back to the beans. I'm like, what? He said, do you notice you're taking off the corn while you're doing the, while you're trying to get the weeds out? What good is that? So I lost my promotion. I was back to picking green beans again. Terrible thing. So I couldn't tell the difference between the corn and the weeds. And I'm telling you, they look almost exactly the same. I couldn't tell. And that's the reason why God is gracious. God is not going to rip up the weeds just in case at the same time the corn or the wheat gets ripped up along with it. So this is what it means. Go on to the next page. This is our parable for today. The lesson is meant to be an encouragement, not a warning. A warn, uh, not a warning like we take, like a lot of people preach on the end times. They often talk and focus upon the negative. Look what God is going to do. Well, that's not what this lesson is about. This lesson is about how, why God is being so gracious and kind to allow the wheat and the weeds to grow together. So in essence, it's an answer to the question of why does God allow suffering to take place? And the simple answer for that is this. Because 2,000 years ago, God could have ended the world, but God saw that there was a kid named Cory who's going to be born 2,000 years into the future. He said, man, he's a pretty cool kid. I think I'm going to allow this world to go on because I want to be in my family. Same thing with you with you guys. God said, I love these people. I can't wait for them to be born. I can't wait for them to be a part of my, uh, my kingdom. I can't wait to see the fruit that they're going to produce and what they're going to do with their lives. That's what God said 2,000 years ago. That's why this world goes on. Because God is ever the optimist. God is probably looking 2,000 years down the future and saying, you know, there's a woman named Sue. There's a guy named Dave, or Pete, or whatever the name. Make up whatever name you want. That guy looks really cool. That woman is going to be so cool. I can't wait for them to be born. I can't wait to see what they can do with their lives. That's what Jesus is saying in the parable. That's why the world goes on, because God cannot wait to see the fruit that his people produce. And God does not want to take away the opportunity from them to produce that fruit. No, I know there's suffering. God allows the suffering. Why does God allow the suffering? Because amidst the great and wonderful things that take place in this world, there's going to be suffering because there are some evil people. But 95% of the suffering in this world can be directly tied to human activity. Famine, war, poverty, all of those things are human-made, avoidable conditions. Every single one of them. And they're caused by those who seek power at the expense of people who are in need. And those people are in service of evil, whether they believe they are not, and they create the conditions for suffering and heartache and pain. So when Jesus is critical, the people he's critical of, again, are politicians and religious leaders who use their positions of power at the expense of those whom they're supposed to help and be serving. God, however, is gracious and kind. 
and allows this world to continue so that the great people, the majority of people, the cool people in life have the opportunity to live and produce fruit. God allows this world to continue that you might live your life and give you the opportunity to grow to fruition. And I will tell you what you need to do is change your perspective of the world. Instead of looking at the world and say, oh my gosh, there's so many idiots, there's so many stupid people in this world. But you need to say, oh my gosh, there's so many wonderful people in this world and only a handful of idiots who are doing the work of Satan. God wants to give every person that opportunity to become who they're created to become. So what I, I'm telling you, this is one of the things I do. I got this in the mail. This is kind of really funny, actually. Considering the way life happens nowadays, I got a catalog. Who sends catalogs anymore? Everything's done online nowadays. Okay, you can go and get t-shirts online and go get things made online that are personalized for you. But this is actually a t-shirt uh, catalog. And I'm looking at this thing, I mean, and it's very sarcastic and, and, uh, and, and cynical of life. In fact, there's all these, all these uh, t-shirts in here. Let me read you a couple. The type of things that you see on Facebook all the time. I disagree, but I respect your right to be stupid. And that's a t-shirt. You know, people wear those type of t-shirts, and all I can tell you is that person you're thinking of has this t-shirt on about you. I'm going to stop asking how dumb you can get, because people seem to be taking it as a challenge. I hate those types of uh, memes on the Facebook, and people wear these type of t-shirts. Here's another one. Uh -uh. I'd love to have a battle of wits with you, but you appear to be unarmed. Ha <laughs> ha, funny, huh? This is the way we treat each other. We treat each other as though we're stupid. We put memes on our Facebook pages that dismiss and diminish and demean other people. This is not the way of God. God doesn't look at people and dismiss, diminish, demean them. God is not cynical. God is not sarcastic. This is not a part of the kingdom of heaven. And if you're using that, I'm telling you, next time somebody posts something like that on Facebook, I'm just warning you, I'm going to come up with some type of thing where I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but if somebody's got a good idea, I'd like to put some type of image or some type of uh, emoji on there that indicates to them, I don't like this. That's not the way we're supposed to treat each other. So I'm telling you, I don't appreciate that because it's not the way that God treats us. So what we need to do is stop seeing evil everywhere around us. The fields are ripe. What we need to start seeing is how ripe the fields are, how beautiful the fields are. They're filled with good people and people trying to uh, fill their life with good things. So what we need to change is not the, we need to change our attitude towards the world and stop being so negative and uh, because the world has continued for the very purpose of, uh, of, of, that great, of, of you and all that wheat that God is growing up amidst the weeds of this world. So what this lesson is supposed to teach us is that we are called to be encouraged. Number five, God has provided the nourishment necessary for us to grow and produce fruit and while you might be surrounded by some weeds, there are weeds there, I'm not going to diminish that, but you will not be choked, you will not be destroyed by the weeds of this life. The weeds, though an annoyance and a distraction, will never prevent you from becoming who you're created to become. So my encouragement to you is stop wistfully thinking about the end of days as though God is going to rescue you. It's not about being rescued from this world, it's about you being a blessing in this world. About us changing our attitude about what this world is. It's not a terrible, awful, uh, horrible world. It's a great world. This is God's world. It is beautiful. You are beautiful, and it's filled with a lot of wonderful, beautiful people. And so I'm inviting you to change your attitude and be encouraged. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for the us to be fruit-filled people that we might bless this world. This world is filled with wonderful people. They may not be producing the fruit that they can yet produce, but I believe that you have planted this world with a lot of wonderful wheat, meant to produce fruit, and meant to bless the world. But we are so impatient, we're so cynical, we're, snow, we're so snarky about each other. Anybody who doesn't agree with us, we dismiss as though they're stupid or dumb or less than. God, people who disagree with us are not stupid and dumb. Forgive us, God, for being so snarky and so cynical and so sarcastic. 
and help us, God, to be more positive about the world that you have created and the people that you've created. Because honestly, if we see them the way you see them, we'd see beautiful people created in your image. And we just ask, God, that you'd help us to produce fruit so that we might be a blessing. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.